promises that he has given to us in his word, we recognize that it is amazing everything that he has in store for us, not only today, but it gets better and better. Or you could say, as some little child would say, it gets gooder and gooder. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. <laughs>
Amen. You may be seated. Children will be dismissed for Children's Church. We have Children's Church started up, so I encourage you to go ahead and send them out for Children's Church. Also, nursery is available for those that are in that group. Birth to two years old is what we're going for with the nursery. So, if you want to do that, you want to go ahead. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verses 1 to 23. Zechariah, chapter 8, verses 1 to 23. In a time when the remnant of Jews who had returned needed a word of encouragement and hope concerning their future, Zechariah brings them a powerful reminder of God's promises and his commitment to Israel. God wanted to remind them that he loved them and would work things out for their good, even if they couldn't see it at that moment. And even today, in our world today, I believe that the promises that we see here, the truths that God is going to set forth, even though there is a specific group of promises that are to Israel because of the fact that they are His chosen people and He is going to deal with them specifically in the Millennial Kingdom. But even then, there are great promises that apply to us as we will participate in the Millennial Kingdom. And as we look at these promises, they were living in days when they're still, they didn't have the completed city. The temple had been rebuilt, but the walls still had not been completed. It would be another 60 years before the walls would be completed. So in that culture, in that day, you would look at it and say, it's difficult days. They still had that the enemies could still come in and harass them, persecute them. So as you look at chapter 8 this morning with me, it is a reminder that we need to, even in our own lives, live in light of future glory. We need to live our lives today in light of what is coming next for us. Let's face it, in our world today, it looks rather dismal, does it not? In our world today, there is chaos and pain and suffering. And even many of you are experiencing pain and suffering, even if nothing more than sheer biologically, you are suffering that. Let's face it, you begin to grow and we see these little babies come in and we're so excited. Oh, look at that. And then you think, and one day they will grow and they will get older and they will also have what? More pain, more suffering. Yet in light of all of that, there is hope. In chapter 7, God reminded us that he judges sin. He reminded Israel that he judges sin, and they had experienced God's judgment personally as most of them had gone through the captivity. They had come out of the captivity. They had returned with the first return that had come. And they were living now in the land. So they understood that what God desired was repentance and living righteously. Now we come to chapter 8, and God challenges them to repent and live righteously because of their glorious restoration. Because of what I have for you. Because of how I'm going to bless you. Live in light of this glorious restoration. Live in light of this future glory as well as how I'm going to bless you today. The blessing today he is going to help them to see is just the tip of the iceberg. They could have gone to many other passages to be able to go back into their writings to be able to see some of the other statements 
that God had already made. They knew the prophet in the writings of the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Jeremiah. And they could see that they had talked about this future blessing when the Messiah would come. But how are we going to live today in light of God's glorious future for us? As we look, we can walk through it and see that there is a future hope based on who God is. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion. Let me just stop there. And you see that just in these couple phrases, what is the one phrase that has been repeated three times already? The Lord of hosts. When you look at it, you see that the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the Lord Almighty, He who is sovereign over all the powers in heaven and on earth, He is the one who is going to do this. There is a future and a hope based on who God is. He is the Lord Almighty. He can pull this off. He can do this for Israel, and He also can guarantee that He will make happen what He has promised even to us as believers in Jesus Christ. So as you look, He says here in the first, second verse, He says, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. See, the word jealous here, the idea of jealous in the Word of God, in relation to who God is, in relation to Israel, is the one who tolerates no rivals. He is jealous in that he says, I will tolerate no rivals. You can go back to the book of Exodus, and you can see it in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. The idea is that it says, I, yes, with great wrath or with great zeal, I am jealous for her or I'm zealous for her, for Israel. He is zealous to protect His uniqueness. He is zealous to maintain the allegiance of His people to Himself alone. And He will do what He has to do in order to make it so that Israel will follow after Him alone. You go back to the beginning of Israel as a nation, and you see that they repeatedly went after other gods. God finally brought them to the place where He took them into the Babylonian captivity. Now they've come out, and He reminds them, I am jealous over you. I want to make sure that there are no other rivals tolerated. I love you. I care for you. I'm the only one for you to follow. So he says, I am jealous for Zion. Zion, sometimes when you say, what in the world is he talking about when he says Zion? Well, Zion is used in several different ways. First of all, it was originally a location. It was a hill, a location that David came and he conquered and made it the capital of the United Kingdom of Israel. So we think of it, and then it, it, as you walk through Scripture, you see that then it really becomes known and, and equates with Jerusalem. So he could say Jerusalem, or he could say Mount Zion, or he could say Zion, and it's referring to the same geographical area. The millennial city is referred to as Zion. In a prophetic sense, it refers to Jerusalem as a future capital of the nation of Israel. In the heavenly city, it's referred to the new Jerusalem into which the church we will be received is referred to as Zion. So when you think of it, when he says, the Lord of hosts is jealous for Zion, he is simply saying, I am jealous for the place where you dwell. That place, Jerusalem. 
I am jealous for that. I don't want any rivals. I don't want anyone else who is going to say that this is their city. No, it's my city. Notice where he goes with that in verse 3. He says, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. God would dwell in Jerusalem. Now, in one sense, once the, once the temple was rebuilt and the glory of God comes to the temple, then in one sense, God is dwelling where? In Jerusalem, in the temple. But really, the bigger sense of this verse is dealing with something that is yet future. Because the idea is, the idea of dwelling is to tabernacle or to be among in a special way. So that the presence of God would personally be there in the midst. And it's at that time that it would be that Jerusalem will be the city of truth. Zion will be the holy mountain. We learn from the book of Isaiah. Micah talks about it as well. We learn that all of the other mountains are going to be laid low. Zion will stand above all of the other hills. So that you all, no matter where you come from, you will come up to worship at Zion. So when you think of the city of truth, it is only when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning there in Israel, in Jerusalem, that it will be considered the city of truth. When you look at it today, could you say that Jerusalem today is the city of truth? No. Okay? But there will be a day when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning, and it will be the city of truth. It will also be a holy mountain. It will be a place of holiness. Not only that, this is also going to be a day when it says in verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the streets. Wow. What an amazing truth that it is a place. You know, it's amazing how times have changed, isn't it? Even in my very short lifetime, <laughs> compared to some of you, okay, okay, in my short lifetime, I can remember how that many times you had in the small villages and cities, you had places, even the front porches, where people would sit out and neighbors would talk and people would sit and chat and people would s gather together. I remember the idea of playing in the streets even in our small community. The kids from up and down the street, there were several street lights, and we would be out there playing football in the street even after it got dark. You play out in the street. But today, the porches have moved from the front to the back of the house, many times with fences around, so the neighbors don't see, you don't share. I mean, when you think of it, this is going to be a time when sitting out in the streets and talking to people as they walk by, old men and women will be out there. No fear of what? No fear of anybody hurting them. No fear of somebody... Doesn't it just make you irate when you hear about some older person, somebody has taken and hurt them, beat them up, ransacked, taken their stuff? No more. In the day in which they were living at that time, it would be very easy for some enemy to come marching through and do them harm. So they didn't just sit out 
and have people come by and chat on the street. And the children were not playing in the streets. But there will come a day when God is once again going to do that. As they looked at this, they looked at their day, they looked at what was happening to them right at that moment, they looked at how different it was as they looked around the city of Jerusalem and the rubble that was there that they would have had to remove even before they could begin to build the temple or the walls or even some of the houses. And they looked at it, and I'm sure, like any of us would, said, where do we even begin? How do we even start here? Many of them were discouraged, and you can see that in Nehemiah's day. He had to come and be that cheerleader, that pep person, that one who comes along and says, we're going to do this. God's going to do this. We're going to make it happen. You look at verse... 6. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if, if, if it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people, in those days will it also be too difficult in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. In other words, <clears throat> what he says is, God will make it happen even if it seems impossible to you doesn't mean it's impossible to the Lord of hosts. And even if you look in your world today and you think of the promises that God has made in relation to the future, even in relation to today in ministry and serving and reaching people for His kingdom, and you say, I just don't see it happening. I look at the statistics and I look and it says that more and more people are turning away from the church and fewer people are following. Why should I even bother? Why? Because God is still able to make it happen. He is still able to transform people's lives today. He is still in the business of building His kingdom. He still is working in hearts and lives. And many times, you may not even know who that individual is. That maybe grandma has been praying for that young child for all of her life. And God wants to use you to speak His truth into that person's life. Important to recognize, don't quit. It's not impossible with God. When you go back to Jeremiah chapter 32, just flip back with me to Jeremiah chapter 32. In verse 17, When you have the promise of the new covenant and you have the promise of what God was going to do in the future for Israel, oh yes, judgment was going to come. Jeremiah lamented over what was going to happen and he lamented over what happened to the city of Israel. But in Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17, he says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. And by your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. Down in verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? No. Nothing is too difficult. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26, when, when Jesus was teaching the disciples and... and uh, rich man turned away and Jesus reminded them that the rich can scarcely get into the kingdom of heaven. It's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. See, they had the idea that if you were rich, then God had blessed you immensely, so therefore you must be pleasing to God, so you're definitely going to heaven. And they said, well, if a rich man can't get into heaven, then who in the world can? And Jesus looked at him and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, He is the God 
of the impossible. It does not take him back when he looks, and maybe you look at the things that are happening in our world today, around the world, and here in America, and you say, I can't believe it's this bad. Listen, it didn't take God by surprise. He's not wringing his hands. He knows where it is going. As you look, he is the God who makes all things possible. I like what one writer says. Little, I mean, when you look at only half of the walls being rebuilt, I'm not going to quote him here, I'll wait to quote him later. You look at only half of the city built 60 years yet before the walls were going to be built. And God wants these people to be busy serving Him and working and living for Him righteously today. And you may say today, what difference is it going to make? Today, God still wants you and me to live holy lives. He still wants us to remember that He will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He wants us to remember, as He told the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be My witnesses we're still His witnesses. Remember that we are His ambassadors for Christ's sake. And He still wants that. He still wants us to believe in who He is. See, God will bring the Jews back from all over the world. Look at what it says in verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I'm going to save My people from the land of the east, and from the land of the west. Basically what he is saying is, over the whole globe, <coughs> I'm going to deliver and bring my people back. Verse 8, I will bring them back and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem and they will be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. He says, they're going to live in Jerusalem. They're going to live in the area around it. They're going to occupy the land that God has promised to them. And they will be My people. What a tremendous statement. After they would have remembered back to the days of Hosea. And how that in the book of Hosea, the names of the children of Hosea, and one of the names of the children of Hosea, Lo Ruhama, not my people. Ouch! But now he says, you will be Ruhama. You will be my people. What an amazing truth that you can go from the place where God would, would judge and, and God would say, not my people. And in the midst of repentance and turning that God says, you are my people. And today we're reminded what it says in the Gospel of John. When it says in verse 11, and they came unto His own. He came. He came literally home. And those of His home rejected Him. But to as many as received Him, He gave the right to be called, for lack of a better phrase, let's just say, My people. Children of God. My people. Those who are related intimately to me. See, we have a lot, even as the Jews had a lot to look at and to say, isn't it amazing what God has done? They will be my people, and God will be their God in truth and righteousness. This is what God had wanted all along, isn't it? God had wanted them to live in relationship with Him, and that they would recognize that He alone is the God of all creation, and that living in relationship with Him truly is the best way to live. 
If you question that, then I challenge even today, in light of where we are today in our world today, Israel had learned that when you don't follow after God and you let the other gods of this world be raised up and you worship the other gods of this world, it will bring disappointment. It will bring, bring pain and suffering no matter what that God is. But the one true God is worth following with everything you've got. He is worth following. He alone is worthy of our praise and our adoration so that in the midst of their looking around at their city, in the midst of looking and saying, look at the rubble, God. Look at this mess. What are we going to do? In verse 9, he reminds them, let your hands be strong. In the midst of our work today, let your hands be strong. Don't quit. Continue to press on. Continue to serve. Continue to seek after the Lord. Don't be discouraged. Don't say, what's the use? Don't be fearful. Look at the end of verse 13. Do not fear. <clears throat> Let your hands be strong. Don't stop working. God had a new day for Israel. And one day, He is going to make it all new, and we're going to be able to enjoy it also. The question today is, are we going to live in light of that future glory? Are we going to press on? Notice in verse 9, He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, you who are listening in these days to the, these words from the mouth of the prophets, those who spoke in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid to the end that the temple might be built. For before those days, there was no wage for man or any wage for animal. And for him who went out or came in, there was no peace because of his enemies. And I said, all men, one against another. But now... I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, declares the Lord. For there will be peace for the seed, and the vine will yield its fruit. The land will yield its produce. The heavens will give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all these things. He is reminding them that this is a new day for you. And I would say that even for us, because we have the power of the Spirit of God within us. Today is a day to pursue after knowing God. To pursue after working for God. Don't become tired with it. Don't quit. Don't be discouraged because you don't see it happening at your pace, at your rate, as fast as you would want it to have happen. He reminds them that the seed will sprout. The vine will yield its fruit. The land will yield its produce. The heavens will deliver the needed water. You, the remnant, will inherit all of this. Look at the, what he says down in verse 15. He just finishes telling them, listen, I did to your fathers what they deserved to have done to them according to my word. I said that's what I would do. That's what I did. Now notice verse 15. So I have again purposed in these days to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. Go back with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Many times I hear people use this verse and they don't use it in the context of what he's talking about. But in Jeremiah chapter 29... In verse 10. He says, Thus says the Lord, When seventy years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. That had happened for the people that Zechariah is talking to. Okay? It already happened for them. Notice what he says. 
Verse 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This is a new day. Zechariah is saying, this is a new day. Verse 15, so I have again purposed in these days in Zechariah, he says. See, God purposed to do good to Israel. Even as they had gone through the judgment, even as they had gone through the captivity, he says, now I purpose to do good to you. I'll make sure that you will have the seed in the ground and it will produce. I'll send the rains. I'll make sure you don't have to be discouraged. There is going to be a great yield. It's all because of God's greatness, God's glory. And he says, but this is what I want you to do. You know, God never leaves us without something to do ourselves, does he? He doesn't say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it without giving us something to what? To participate in. Something for us to do as well. We know that it's ultimately all because of who? Because of him. Because of the power and the excellency is of him and not of us. But he encourages and challenges and says, this is what I want you to do. Look at verse 16. These are the things which you should do. He says, I I've said what I'm going to do. Now, in light of the future glory, there's some things I want you to do. He's not even done telling them everything yet that he's going to do, but he says, there's something I want you to do. He says, speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. Also let none of you devise evil in your heart against another. And do not love perjury, for all these things are what I hate, declares the Lord. So what does he say? Here's what I want you to do. Remember, a lot of times we say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, you haven't opened his word up. Because it's full of what he has said. And at the very heart of what he says, we could simply go back to Micah 6, 8. He says, well, I can't, I'm trying to think here. What is it that God wants me to do? He wants you to love mercy. He wants you to walk humbly with him. I mean, that's at the core. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor what? As yourself. So do justice, love, mercy. Walk humbly with your God. He reminds them here, speak the truth to one another. Don't lie. You go to the book of Ephesians. And in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, we're reminded, and he goes through chapter 3 and chapter 4, and you can see what he says. And when he says, don't lie. When he says, don't lie, he doesn't just leave it with don't lie. He says, speak the truth. You know, it's always right to do right. It's always right to speak right. It's always right to demonstrate love in the face of of anger. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That's what he reminds us in Romans. See, there may be times when somebody might do things that's not peaceful to you, but as much as it lies in you, you're to what? Live peacefully. Don't devise evil in your heart against anyone. So someone is saying things, doing things, acting out in ways that are against what you want, what you think. Do you in the creative thinking of your own business, thought business, are you thinking 
what you would like to see happen to them. Don't do that. Do not, in your thinking, meditate on, chew over, and devise evil against anyone, even your worst enemy. With those, we are to pray for those who would despitefully use you. We're to repay evil with good. For in so doing, we heap coals of fire upon their head. God reminds us, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. God knows how he will deal with the unjust, how he will deal with sinners. We don't need to. Don't love perjury. Don't perjure. You, when you are going to be a witness, make sure that what you say is truthful. Make sure that you are always going to speak the truth. Don't lie for somebody else. And this last one. Hate what I hate, God says. Notice the last phrase there when he says, for all these things are what I hate, declares the Lord. I mean, really the bottom line for all of it is, God is a God of truth. He is holy. He is just. He is love. He is righteous. He's all of that. And he says, I want you to hate what I hate. And you go back to Proverbs chapter 6, and it reminds us, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. It's not, it's not an exhaustive list, but he says, I hate this. Pride is at the top of the list. You know, haughty eyes, proud look. See, the one who sheds innocent blood, the one who sows discord among the brothers, lying lips, all of that God hates. And we ought to also what? See, when you go over to Proverbs chapter 8, he reminds us the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If I don't hate evil, then neither do I really fear God. We need to hate what He hates. God goes on and He reminds them not only would He not treat them as the former days, and that he had purposed to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, so they did not need to fear. And he wanted them to do certain things. In verse 18, he says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. This, this is good. I, I love this one. He says, You know those feasts that you've been doing? Those feasts that you have been, where those, those days of fasting, where you have had a fast and you were mourning over what happened to Jedaliah or what happened when Nebuchadnezzar came up against the city or when the walls were breached or when the temple was destroyed. We talked about it last week. Remember, he says, all of those times that you fasted and mourned, I'm going to turn them into feasting and celebration. Wow. See, he says, I'm going to turn your mourning to gladness and joy. When he says in verse 19, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth months will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. So love truth and mercy. He says, love truth and mercy. I like what G. Campbell Morgan says on this. He says, their observance would be a feast in celebration of God's grace instead of a fast in memory of their sin. Now think of it. All of the fasts that they had in each of those months with mourning, were directly connected to the fact that God had to judge them because of their sin. Now, there would be a feast and a celebration because of God's grace 
and being able to turn it into a great celebration. No longer fasting because of my sin, but feasting because of God's grace. And He wants you and I today to live in light of the glory that He has prepared for us. Jesus told His disciples, you believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am there you may be also. You know what He said that in the face of? Don't grieve. Don't worry. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Later on in the same chapter, He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. See, today, no matter what is happening in our world, we can have peace because of who we are connected to. Because He is the one who says, I have gone to prepare a place for you. And the glory of this place, there is nothing on this world that can compare to it. He wanted the children of Israel to be diligent and serving and working and not quitting and just loving truth and peace. He says, you're not going to even believe what's going to happen. You can't even begin to fathom what I'm going to do. In verse 20, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, It will yet be. In other words, it wasn't that day. It wasn't happening right then. But it will happen that people will come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one will go to another saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will also go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Emmanuel, God with us, right? That's what it is. He will be in their midst. And people from every nation. Listen, nations will come to worship in Jerusalem. The nations of the world are not coming to worship there today. But there will be a day when they do that. When Jesus Christ sits enthroned there on Mount Zion in the city of God, in the holy mountain, and they will be begging you, He says to the Jew, to the Jew, he says, they will be begging you to come and worship with you. Listen, they wanted to mock you. They wanted to kill you. They wanted to ridicule your God all through history. But there will come a day when they will be begging you to come and worship with you. Wow. Is God awesome or what? He is the Lord Almighty. As you look, you see that they will come. I'm reminded though of what it says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. See, when we, when, when today, when people see Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's what can draw people to say, I want what you have. But are they seeing Christ in me, the hope of glory. Do we recognize that we are Christ's servant for them? That He is the one who is pleading through us. That we are pleading out to the people, be reconciled to God. We're His ambassadors. The only Christ they may see is in us. You think of the glory of what He is saying here and the hope that this brings these individuals 
several passages to help us think it through. The book of Isaiah chapter 60. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Then you will see and be radiant and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. I mean, have you ever thought about the abundance of the sea will be turned to you? I wonder how much is lost in the oceans. Hmm. Okay. Just an idea. The wealth of the nations will come to you. The gates will be open continually. Hey, listen. Why in these expensive neighborhoods do they close the gates? So nobody can what? Because they're fearful of who might be able to get in, who might do them harm. But you leave the gates open and there's continual light because you're never afraid of what is going to come because the king is ruling and reigning. They will not be closed day or night so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. So the kings are going to lead the way saying, we need to go and take this with us. Verse 14 and 18, 20. The sons of those who afflicted will come bowing to you. Wow. The very fact that those who would oppress Israel, there will come a day when those nations that even have oppressed, that they will bow and say, <coughs> please forgive. We want to come and worship with you. All those who despise you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. Micah 4, And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. Listen, that's hope, friends. And the children of Israel as they looked at the devastation and the unsettledness around them, needed to know that the Lord of hosts, the God Almighty, would pull this off. And that He would bless them in a way that was beyond what they could ever imagine. In Isaiah 65, ultimately God is creating a new heaven, a new earth. You see that in Revelation 21 and verse 1. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Jerusalem will be a place of rejoicing. No weeping or sound of crying heard in it. Could you imagine that? Where there will not even be a tear. There's no crying. You'll never hear anybody weeping. Whoa. See, all weeping and sadness is connected to sin. And God's going to wipe what? It away. No infant mortality or premature death of an adult will enjoy the work of your hands. In other words, what would happen sometimes in Israel? They would go out and work and they would sow and they would plant and things would grow up and things would start to produce and the enemy would come in and what? Take it. They never even got to eat what they worked so hard to be able to produce. Peace within the animal kingdom. The lion and the lamb will lay down together. I mean, unbelievable what God is going to do. And it just gets better and better or gooder and gooder. Okay? You just can't improve on what God has for them. But He also has it for us too. He has a blessing for us that when you go over to the book of Revelation, and you read in the book of Revelation the descriptions that's given. We don't have time this morning to go there to be able to read it, but you read Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 22, and you see this amazing city that God has prepared, that Jesus Christ has gone and prepared. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, adorned as it is as a bride for the groom. It is made a special 
especially for his believers. And you look at, we get to live in that place. 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. If you were to go from New York City to Miami, it's that long, that wide, that high. Is that amazing or what? And the gates, every gate is a single pearl. Now remember, the gates are always open. We just get to observe it and look at it. And the streets are so pure that the light just comes through them. Pure gold. No more crying. No more tears. No more remembrance of the past. For all eternity, it's all done. And we get to celebrate and worship and work with Him in that environment for all eternity. Don't get so caught up with today that you lose sight of what's in the future. Don't get, don't, don't get so rooted here that you forget and you put all of your energy and all of your investment in today. Make sure you're investing for eternity. Matthew chapter 6 reminds us of that. Can you say with the songwriter, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would fill us with a knowledge of your will and spiritual understanding that we might glean from your word the great hope that you have not only for Israel, but for us. Lord, help us today to live in light of the future glory that you have prepared for us. Help us to be your people making a difference in our world for you today. May there be people rejoicing in heaven with us because we have taken the good news of the gospel of peace and reconciliation to them. And your Holy Spirit has empowered us and you have changed and transformed their lives. Father, thank you for the privilege of participating in your ministry and your work. In Jesus' name, amen.